Tony Leung has long been an acting legend in Asia. But many viewers, particularly in the US, may have discovered him when they saw Marvel's Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. So I was among those who already knew Tony Leung long before he became part of the MCU, but I thought that instead of being a snob about it, huh, I loved him before it was cool. I thought it would be more interesting to share my recommendations with you for anyone who fell in love with Tony Leung in Shang-Chi as Wenwu and might want to check out his filmography. Shang-Chi was actually his 79th movie, so I want to make clear right now, I haven't seen all of them, but I have seen 16 of them. You have the list here. Finally, before I start, I want to say that I do not speak Mandarin or Cantonese, so sorry if I don't pronounce all of these names correctly. But even if, like me, you do not understand these languages, I would strongly advise you to still watch these movies in their original version. For all the Hong Kong movies, original version means Cantonese version. For the Chinese movies, it will be the Mandarin version. And unfortunately, in many cases, Tony Leung's voice will actually be dubbed because he's not a native speaker of Mandarin and he speaks with an accent, which bothers Chinese audiences because it's, it sounds a bit weird. And just a little tip to avoid confusion, there are two famous Chinese actors named Tony Leung. This is why you see him referred to as Tony Leung Chu Wai, to distinguish him from Tony Leung Ka Fai, who is another actor. So here we go. My seven favorite Tony Leung movies. Number seven. In the Mood for Love, Wong Ka Wai, 2000. Probably the most famous out of all of Wong Kar Wai's movies, and it's quite fitting to start this list with a Wong Kar Wai movie because really, Wong Kar Wai is a director that is forever associated with Tony Leung. Wong Kar Wai has made 10 movies, Tony Leung was in 7 of them, and 3 of them will be on this list because I'm a big Wong Kar Wai fan. This is a movie set in Hong Kong in the 1960s, and it tells the story of a woman and a man who live in the same apartment building. It's a kind of tiny space, it's crowded and noisy. But as is often the case with Wong Kar Wai's movies, the story is really about people who feel lonely in a crowded space. I do not want to spoil the story too much because you will discover what's going on with little hints and little bits of dialogue here and there. But Basically, both of them are married and both of them are neglected by their partners and they slowly start bonding over this. It is often considered to be the epitome of the sophistication and class of Chinese cinema. This movie is simply breathtakingly beautiful. Each shot is carefully constructed, the actors and the costumes are beautiful and classy, the music is beautiful and classy, Everything really exudes class and sophistication in this movie with this kind of retro charm of the 1960s. It is primarily a movie about longing and frustration and heartbreak. Do not expect to see much action. There's a reason why it's called In the Mood for Love. So it is pretty slow. You need to really be able to luxuriate in the beauty of it and be willing to accept the many slow motion shots and the fact that a lot of things are in the subtext as well. It is very restrained and sometimes frustrating as well. But you also have a, a little humor and you'll find one of Wong Kar Wai's trademarks, which is a mix between very poetic, abstract considerations and very mundane things, in particular food. The two main characters keep running into each other when they're going out to get some food, to get soup or noodles. And this kind of um, grounds the story in something a bit, a bit less ethereal and a bit more mundane. If you love this one, know that there is another film, 2046, which is more or less a sequel, but never, it's never really a sequel with Wong Kar Wai. It's never that straightforward, but it's kind of a sequel to In the Mood for Love, so you may like it. The only reason I'm not ranking In the Mood for Love higher on this list is simply that I find it a bit too polished and perfect. It makes it a bit cold to me. And that trend is pushed even further in 2046, which is why it's not my favorite. In the Mood for Love is definitely a masterpiece which completely deserved the high praise it received at the time. And I think it can be a good way of uh, getting acquainted with Wong Kar Wai's cinema. Number six, Lost Caution. Ang Lee, 2007. This one is a very controversial movie and you should be warned that it's not for everyone. 
It is a very dark movie with a very dark subject matter. It's often defined as um, an erotic espionage movie. And it tells the story of a Chinese student called Wong, played by actress Tang Wei, who gets into a relationship with a powerful but extremely dangerous man, Mr. Yi, played by Tony Leung, in the aim of helping her friends of the Chinese resistance assassinate the man. Her friends decide to use her as a honey trap, and thus she enters a very dangerous and ambiguous relationship with the Yi household and with Mr. Yi himself. This film was awarded the Golden Lion in the Venice Film Festival, but the announcement was booed by part of the audience. The main reason why some people dislike this movie is that it contains some extremely graphic sex scenes, often quite violent, and which you could say are bordering on the pornographic. You will see a lot of them. You will see a lot of Tony Leung and a lot of Tang Wei in this film. And of course, the nature of this relationship between the two characters also kind of blurs the lines of consent. So you could argue that at least one of these scenes is a rape scene, but the rest is more difficult to define because precisely the nature of this relationship becomes harder and harder to define. And that is the point of the movie, pretty much. So clearly the film can be pretty disturbing. Mr. Yi himself, is a very complex character, probably the worst that Tony Leung has ever played. He's clearly morally a horrible person. But one of the reasons why the film is so gripping is precisely this tension created by his enigmatic behavior. The fact that you never really know what he's going to be like, if he's going to behave like a violent psychopath or like a kind of gentlemanly, gentle lover. Also, I want to stress that this film is about 2 hours and 30 minutes long, and these sex scenes take maybe 10 minutes altogether. So it's not like it's all there is to this film. It's not just sex scenes. It's a lot more than this. But yes, they are there and they might be a bit shocking to you. In the end, I'd say it's definitely worth seeing, if only to see Tony Long as a real villain. He often plays sympathetic characters so well because he's got this incredible warmth and kindness in his eyes that he's very famous for, but he can also be very scary and precisely because you never know what you think and he can blow hot and cold and it makes it even scarier and more unnerving in this movie. But be warned that this is not a feel-good movie. It is beautiful, but it is grim and haunting. I know it takes me several hours, if not several days, to get it out of my head after watching it. So if you think you can handle this kind of very dark material and enjoy it, then go for it, absolutely. It's a great movie. But if you don't, maybe skip it and try to start with something else. Number five, Hero, Zhang Yimou, 2002. This film is yet another genre, which is wuxia. Wuxia could be described as sort of Chinese fantasy films involving lots of martial arts, but not in a realistic style. I will only say a few things about the story, because for this one I would say it's quite important to avoid spoilers, because it goes in directions that you might not expect. It tells the story of Nameless, an assassin, highly skilled assassin, played by Jet Li, who wants to get a face-to-face -face encounter with the king, whom he wants to kill, because he sees him as a tyrant who forcefully tried to unify the six kingdoms that formed China at the time of the story. In order to gain access to the king, Nameless has brought the weapons of three very famous warriors who are all well-known opponents of the king. Sky, played by Donnie Yen, Snow, played by Maggie Chung, and her lover, Broken Sword, played by Tony Leung. The originality of the film lies in the fact that there are several stories within the story and each phase is represented by a dominant color, red, blue, green and white. This film has extremely beautiful fights which involve real skills and martial arts, but they are not realistic fights. They are often conceived more like a dance. It's really about admiring the human body in movement and also about poetry and a battle of minds and characters. The, the fighters constantly defy gravity and execute impossible moves. You'll see them jump incredibly long distances almost as if they could fly and dive headfirst onto their opponent or bounce off the surface of the water, so it's not realistic. One of the great classics in wuxia films is to show fights set in nature, in particular bamboo forests, and clearly the opening fight scene in Shang-Chi 
between Wen Wu and Ying Li, his future wife, is meant to reference Wu Xia, the way Ying Li seems to manipulate nature while she's fighting. In particular, the whirlwind of leaves that she creates is reminiscent of Hero. There's a very similar fight with autumn leaves flying around Maggie Chung and Zhang Ziyi. Tony Leung hasn't really been in many wuxia films. He is not primarily a martial artist, unlike people like Jet Li or Donnie Yen. He's an actor, first and foremost, but he's quite convincing in those movies too. He's wonderful in this film. His character is probably the most interesting one, and to make things even better, he's absolutely gorgeous in this film. He's gorgeous in red, he's gorgeous in blue, he's gorgeous in green, and he's gorgeous in white. So all in all, I'd say this one is a pretty easy one to watch for viewers who have never really watched Chinese movies. It's beautiful, it's not very complicated, it's not too slow, it's pretty uh, friendly to Western viewers. And it was actually one of the very first Chinese movies I saw myself in a theatre. Number 4. Happy Together, Wong Kar Wai, 1997 Another Wong Kar Wai movie, and this one is particularly interesting because it depicts a love story between two men, Chinese men, but it is set in Argentina in the 1990s. Ho, Leslie Chung's character, is a charmer and a rather easygoing person, but someone who also gets in trouble very easily with he, he hangs out with the wrong people. Lai, Tony Leung's character, is a more serious guy, a bit more of a tough guy stereotype, he always has a job, he's much more put together, and he's kind of the rock that Ho will cling to whenever he has made a mistake and he's lost and he doesn't know what to do anymore. One of the really interesting things about this film is that it's a gay romance, but it could really be any romance, the way it is told. It really depicts various moments of a relationship, of a difficult, rocky relationship between two people, with its ups and downs, with fight and jealousy and lust, but also tenderness and love, so it is just a relationship in all its complexity and its messiness, if you want. It seemed to me that it was quite refreshing in the 1990s to see a film that treated gay romance as simply a love story. Very often gay romance would focus on the subversive nature of the relationship and the whole social norms that they were breaking and how society is preventing them from being together. And of course it is important to represent this as well, the reality of homophobia. And obviously not being gay, I may not be the best person to talk about this, I would be interested in knowing what a gay person would think about this. It can be worth noting that Leslie Chung was actually bisexual in real life, probably one of the very few openly queer actors in Hong Kong at the time. He was famous for playing roles that involved bending the boundaries of gender, for example in uh, the 1993 film Farewell My Concubine, which won the Palme d'Or in Cannes. The two actors have amazing chemistry. The tango scenes in particular are very beautiful. And by the way, when I was doing a bit of research for this video, I stumbled upon a great documentary on YouTube which showed Tony Leung and Leslie Chung rehearsing for the tango scenes of the movie. It's quite funny and also a bit annoying to see how the reporter seemingly can't get over the fact that you have two men dancing tango together. And it's even funnier to see Tony Leung correct her when she tells him that normally tango involves a man and a woman and he's like, no, actually tango has a long history of men dancing with other men. Finally, one thing I love about this film is its incredible use of music. This is one of Wong Kar Wai's trademarks, he has many, but that's one of them. And it's particularly wonderful in this one, both uh, the tango music and the use of pop songs. Wong Kar Wai is a master at using this kind of bittersweet irony that will hit you right in the feels. And the title of the movie, Happy Together, is clearly very ironic. And yes, you will hear the title song, Happy Together, and believe me, if you're like me, when it comes, it will hit you hard. Number 3. Redcliffe, John Woo, 2008 This film is a historical epic which focuses on one very famous battle, the Battle of Redcliffe. This is actually a real historical battle fought in the early 3rd century in China, but it is mostly known through fictionalized accounts, uh, especially one of the 14th century called the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. In a way, if we want to find a Western equivalent, it would probably be the Trojan War. It's a rather complex story which depicts a conflict between Cao Cao, the villain of the movie, 
with the northern warlord trying to take over the other kingdoms, and an alliance of two southern lords, Sun Xuan, a powerful but inexperienced ruler, and Liu Bei, an aging warlord who has mostly suffered defeats at the hands of Cao Cao. But the main characters in the story are really Zhou Yu, played by Tony Leung, the general that leads Sun Xuan's army, who is portrayed very much as a romantic hero and a great noble soldier, and Zhuge Liang, played by Takeshi Kaneshiro, Liu Bei's main strategist, who's an absolute genius and who is also, incidentally, my absolute favorite character in this movie. The best aspect of this movie is, without a doubt, the way these two men kind of get to know each other and learn how to work together to combine their forces and their wits against Cao Cao. In addition to this, in the same way that in the Trojan War the Greeks have Achilles and Ajax and others, and the Trojans have Hector in particular, one of the warlords in Redcliffe, Liu Bei, has a number of heroes fighting for him who are so incredibly skilled that each of them is basically a one-man army. Another thing I really like about this film is that it has some space for female characters. One is Xiao Chao, who is Zhou Yu's wife, and who gets to play a major part because General Cao Cao, the villain, has developed a kind of sick crush on her. And the other one is Princess Sun Shangshan, and she's a warrior princess. And I like the fact that they gave space to these characters, but also that they embody two types of femininity. It's not just the annoying trope of celebrating the tomboy character that would be Sun Shangshan, while dismissing the more stereotypically feminine one, uh, that would be Xiao Xiao. In this case, they're both interesting and they're both very useful in the greater scheme of things. So this is completely different from the Wong Kar Wai movies. And on this one, my advice might be particularly useful because there are two versions of this movie. The Chinese version of Red Cliff is actually, well, the one I guess you could call the original version. It is made of two movies, part one and part two. Each of them is about two hours and a half. But the international version, the one that was released in Western countries in theatres, is one movie that's about 2 hours and 30 minutes. Personally, I saw this condensed version for Western audiences in a movie theatre. That was my first viewing of the movie, and I still absolutely loved it. It's actually incredible to think that they managed to produce something that watchable, but I still, I still prefer the longer version. The main differences between the two versions are that the longer version takes much more time to introduce all the characters. There are lots of characters, so you kind of need to get to know each of them through little stories and scenes. In particular, the secondary characters and the heroes fighting in Liu Bei's army, like uh, Guan Yu, Zhao Yun and Zhang Fei. And the international version, the shorter one, does not really give you a chance to really know who these guys are. And they probably were aware of that because they felt the need to add some name tags. Like the first time you see them, it says Zhang Fei, general in Liu Bei's army, so, so that people do not get lost. But it doesn't really work that well. I know I was pretty lost. Uh, I saw the names, forgot them a second later, and was a bit confused about who was who. In the longer version, you will get to see these characters more, so you know who they are. You also get to see an even more clever version of Zhuge Liang and Zhou Yu's plan to trick Cao Cao. And I won't spoil it, but my favorite part is the one that involves trying to get a hundred thousand arrows. You will see. And just in general, you get a lot more character development in the longer version, which is what I like about it. So for me, the five-hour version is really not too long. It's not boring. I, I really enjoy watching it. But to be honest, I also loved the shorter one when I saw it first, so you could also just start with the short one and then watch the long one if you enjoyed the short one. It's also a possibility. In any case, it's a great movie to watch even if you're not into Asian cinema. It's fun, it's exciting, it's got great action sequences, great battles. It's a John Woo film after all. And it has lots of humour too. It does not take itself too seriously. It's not pompous, it's, it's fun. And the direction is great and the cast is extremely solid. Number 2. Chungking Express, Wong Kar Wai, 1994. It's very hard to pick one favourite out of all of Wong Kar Wai's movies, but if I really had to choose, I would probably choose this one. And I particularly like this one because of its energy and optimism, in particular 
compared to later Wong Kar Wai works. One thing you really need to know before watching Chunking Express is that this film is split into two parts and these two parts are actually barely connected to one another. They're, they're like really two different parts. The, the characters just run into one another very briefly and that's all there is. And while there are things I love in both parts of the movie, I think most viewers would agree that the second part is really the best part. It is not a very long movie, so each part is around 40 minutes. So what I'm trying to say is don't give up until you've seen the second part, because you might not love the first part so much and still enjoy the second part very much. They're very different. Each part tells the story of a woman and a cop who has just been dumped by his girlfriend. The first part is a bit dark. The main character is a lady with a blonde wig and a raincoat and she wears sunglasses all the time and she's involved in the underworld, especially drug dealing. So the aesthetics, it feels a lot like film noir. So it is beautifully done, as usual with Wong Kar Wai, it's always beautifully done, but clearly it's not my favorite part of the movie. The other character, the cop, is played by Takeshi Kaneshiro in one of his very, very first roles when he was very young. And he's clearly a bit of a loser. He's a bit pathetic and a bit annoying, but he's also kind of relatable. And that's really a Wong Kar Wai trademark especially in his early films, to have these characters that are kind of lost in an urban jungle, lonely in the middle of a crowd, and who are kind of wacky and quirky, but somehow lovable losers in a way. Cop 663 buys Chef Salad for his air hostess girlfriend every day, only to discover at one point that she never actually liked it. And soon after, his girlfriend actually leaves him. As he's trying to deal with his breakup, Faye, a girl who works at the food joint where he gets his food, falls in love with him, but she's not really going to use a very normal approach uh, to try and get closer to him because she's a bit weird and very socially awkward. So you will see she does some... She has a strange way of expressing her love, let's say. It's often a little surreal, but you still relate to them very strongly, at least in my case it works. And to be clear, while I probably identify way too much with Faye and I find this depiction of the relationship extremely cute in the film, I really wouldn't recommend using any of the things she does in real life. Most of what she does may be poetic and quirky and funny in the film, but in life it would be creepy and it would probably get you a restraining order rather than a date with Tony Lung. Some highlights of this movie include Tony Lung talking to his house and the objects in his house. I really love those scenes. But I will not say too much, because really, it's a film that has to be seen and experienced. Number one, Infernal Affairs, Andrew Lau and Alan Mack, 2002. Again, a completely different type of movie, which really goes to show how diverse Tony Lung's film filmography really is. You may or may not know that, but Martin Scorsese's The Departed is actually based entirely on this film. The Departed is basically an American remake of Infernal Affairs. It is a wonderful thriller which stars Tony Lung as the cop who goes undercover among gangsters, so that is Leo's role in the Martin Scorsese film, and another very famous actor of Hong Kong and Chinese cinema, Andy Lau, as the corrupt cop who actually works for the gangsters. So that would be Matt Damon's role in the American version. The film is an incredibly engrossing thriller. The action scenes are riveting. They had me glued to my seat the whole time. The rhythm is close to perfection. The actors are amazing. Both are very subtle actors who can convey a vast array of emotions during very tense scenes without doing too much, which is necessary for the role as both men are undercover. The soundtrack is amazing as well. And honestly, it's not that I want to be that annoying movie snob who always tells people. Obviously the original is so much better than the remake. But in this case, I really think it is. I didn't enjoy The Departed when I first saw it in a movie theater, but after seeing Infernal Affairs, I find it very hard to enjoy The Departed because for me, really, all the good things in The Departed are the things that they lifted from the original which is pretty much the whole plot. I mean, they changed a few things, but it's mostly the same plot. What really strikes me when I rewatch the American version after seeing this one is that it has added way more dialogue and in particular way more profanity. It's like there's at least one obligatory F-bomb in every sentence. And while I see that they were trying to adapt this to American culture, which is probably more extroverted and less controlled and understated, uh, for me, it doesn't really bring much to the movie. It's 
brings nothing to the movie, you mother The strength of the original lies precisely in the incredible tension it manages to create, and this tension relies in part on silences, and it really does not need dialogue. There is one incredible tragic scene in the middle of the film during which Tony Leung does not utter a single word and yet it is incredibly powerful. Really with actors like Tony Leung or Andy Lau who are so charismatic and so subtle you don't need them to blabber to convey horror or fear or desperation. So in short for me Infernal Affairs is very much a perfect movie. I loved it the first time I saw it, I loved it on rewatch and there is not one single thing I would change about this movie. And I think it is totally easy to watch for a Western audience. I see no reason why a Western audience couldn't appreciate it. So go watch Infernal Affairs right now if you haven't seen it. Thank you very much for watching. These were my seven favorite Tony Leung films and recommendations. If you do watch some of these films for the first time, I would really love to hear what you think in the comments. And if you were already a Tony Leung fan, I would also love to hear what you think and see your recommendations, so let me know in the comments. See you soon, bye bye!